everybody. I hope you had a good night's sleep. I was awake at two, three, four, five, and six, thinking about how to cram all of this into a very short space. When we were putting the conference uh, programme together, we envisaged that we might have a couple of workshops and that one of the workshops might revolve around treasure. So the point of this session is to uh, recap um, the process itself, some of the issues, and then to open the floor up um, to people to make comments about the process or things that they would like to be revised or reviewed, um, ways that SMA might be able to enable some training, etc, etc, etc. Um, so, just to put you in the frame, we also are very lucky to have Ian Richardson here this morning who wants to count up Ian. Ian is the Treasure Registrar who's based at the British Museum, so if I get anything wrong, he's going to tell me off. Um, and if there are any hard questions, he's going to answer them. So we'll just get that straight to start off with in the beginning. Um, so my connection with Treasure is I am a member of the Treasure Valuation Committee, but I also sit on the Portable Antiquities Advisory Group and the House Best Practice Working Group, and the museum's uh, portable antiquity scheme group as well. Um, I have been, um, I pre predate the Treasure Act in terms of having to deal with treasure, so I have dealt with it in the old-fashioned way, and clearly now I have to understand um, what all of the issues are with the new-fashioned way and, and some of the problems. So um, I appreciate that there are people in the room that don't necessarily deal with treasure on a day-to-day -day basis. So for those of you that do, you're just going to have to bear with me for the next five minutes while we recap what is or isn't treasure. So in the beginning, um, so before the Treasure Act in 1996, everything was dealt under the old common law of treasure trove. And in a, a nutshell, what that said was items which were precious metal, gold or silver, that had been hidden and rediscovered, for which ownership could not be proven, with no known heir and buried with intent to recover. And the reason the Sultan who um, Helmet just there has got a big red cross on it because all of that Sutton Hoo treasure that came out in 1939 was not treasure trove because it was deemed not to have been buried with the intent to recover because it was part of a funeral context. And that phrase, the buried with intent to recover, was probably one of the most problematic things um, that um, treasure trove brought with it. So this distinction. Um, and obviously there were failings in this in that uh, it didn't cover anything which wasn't made of gold or silver. And we all know that there are some really important things which we would like to keep, which are significant in terms of the archaeological record and British heritage, um, which sit outside of that, not least of which the things that are found with items made out of gold or silver. So in terms of the criteria, just to give you a, this big green tick, the Mildenhall treasure, which was discovered uh, by a farmer in 1942, um, and then the, that find was actually concealed until after the war, um, was treasure because um, it was deemed to have been buried with intent to recover. It's made out of silver. Um, and the, the different thing about this one was, in terms of the finders, because they had concealed the find of treasure, the amount of reward they were paid, which is usually the market value even then, of the find was reduced. Um, that little chap on the left-hand side is very dear to my heart. He is a gentleman called Dr. Hugh Alderson Fawcett. Uh, I look after 7,514 items that he collected during his lifetime and he was the gentleman that turned up in the farmhouse one day and, and told them that actually all of the things they'd been using for fruit at Christmas were actually a really important treasure find and promptly shopped them to the authorities. Um, so it was reported. Um, so we have the definition. Anyway, we shoot along. Uh, new legislation. So even though it's called the Treasure Act 1996, it actually covers fines from 24th of September 1997. Um, that's really important because sometimes we still get fines which are reported to us um, that were found that predate the Treasure Act and we have to deal with them with the legislation that predated the Treasure Act and that is important. Um, it has been other items of treasure, the definition of treasure um, was changed by the Tre De Treasure Designation Order in 2002 which added new categor categories and as Mike mentioned last night, it's also accompanied by a very thick code of practice, which is now 10 years overdue for review. So it's been through a review once. Um, as far as we were concerned, um, Treasure, we were consulted during uh, this process of putting the Treasure Act together because Bristol, London, Corporation of London, the Duchess of Lancaster and Cornwall may or may not have a franchise to collect Treasure over and above the Crown. Because essentially, once treasure is deemed to be treasure by a coroner, belongs to the, the crown. Um, and we were given that right about 500 years ago. So 
So actually, we had to say we would treat any finds of treasure that came out of our area of potential franchise the same as any other, because we wanted to encourage people to report. So, sorry about the wordy definition, but this suddenly becomes our definition, and this is a reduced version of it. So it's not just gold and silver, it's a percentage by weight, things which are more than 300 years old, uh, groups of two or more if they are prehistoric of any composition found together in the same place, coins significantly, single coin finds obviously not, two or more which are the same, which are more than 10% gold or silver and more than 300 years old, unless the copper alloy. The picture I showed you at the beginning of my slide set were um, some of the 11,500 coins which are copper alloy, which were a treasure find that came out of the ground in Thornbury when a gentleman was digging his fish pond. Um, and they were treasure because they were more than 10 and they were more than 300 years old. And significantly, anything else which is found together in the same place. So the box, the bag, the jewellery, any other kind of material that's found in the same place as that treasure is considered to be part of that find. And then right at the very bottom, any object that would have been previously treasure but does not fall into any of those categories above. And I think the most recent one I can think of that was reported very widely in the press, if you remember, somebody found quite a lot of gold coins which had been hidden in the back of a piano and somebody had to decide whether they were going to be treasure trove as opposed to treasure because they were less than 300 years old. So obviously hidden with intent to recover. There is a duty to report. Um, this is a news item about um, the first person who was prosecuted for failure to report and actually then the, the prosecution was dropped. But you've got to report all your fines to a coroner for the district in, in which they're fined, either within 14 days of finding it or within 14 days of realising because quite a lot of people do not realise that they have found treasure until they are told. And you can go to prison for not doing so or you can be um, fined an unlimited fine or both. So actually, the legislation does um, carry some weight in terms of what could happen to you if you don't report. doesn't mean that everybody reports. <coughs> um, if you report and you've acted in good faith, uh, you might get a share of the reward. And the reward is based on the uh, market value, the hammer price of that particular find. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So if you are any of these, um, you can actually be apportioned some treasure. Now, just, that's the Thornbury board. It's the same board um, that I showed you the picture before. But you can see that there's a very big sum of money at the bottom just there, £120,000 worth. That's because the finder weighed a proportion of the coins, worked out how many there were, worked out, extrapolated from that, went to eBay to find out what one of those coins would actually be worth and worked out it's 120,000. It was actually valued at 40,000 pounds by the Treasury Valuation Committee, which is a significant difference. So sometimes people's ideas of what treasure may or may not be worth um, can be conflated by the way that they've tried to work it out for themselves or because of eBay. Um, if you are a digger, you don't get any reward at all. Um, so if you're making a search, uh, you're part of a dig, uh, or in anybody engaged in an archaeological in investigation. And that little ring on the right-hand side is a gold ring which was found under our old council house in Bristol during an excavation. It was on Bristol City Council land. It came straight to the museum. It wasn't the <coughs> it was paid any reward for it. Um, and so it just came to us. So rewards are not payable to professionals or anybody else. So that could be volunteers that are on digs as well. Um, in terms of positive and negatives, at the Portal Antiquities Scheme Conference, which was at the British Museum a couple of weeks ago, Andrew Woods of the Yorkshire Museum um, gave a very succinct um, case study about the positive and negative effects of the Treasure Act and the treasure process on museums. And I'm not intending uh, rehearsing all of the things that, that he um, talked about, because this was specific to his museum. There is a set of his slides which he's very kindly published via a Twitter feed of his which I would urge you, there are only 11 slides, and it puts it into uh, a context. So you can see one of 11, um, it takes you through what some of the benefits and disbenefits of the treasure process has been as far as display, acquisition, et cetera, et cetera, is concerned. So I would recommend that if you haven't seen that, you don't have to have a Twitter account to be able to read a Twitter thread. And then in terms of the review, clearly, uh, as far as some of us are concerned, there are significant items that come out of the ground which do not get designated as treasure because they don't meet any of those categories but are deemed quite important. 
So on the left-hand side, you can see that very lovely cavalry helmet, uh, which was quite fragmentary when it came out of the ground. Um, the local museum couldn't acquire it. It went to auction. It went for £2.3 million. Pounds. It is not in public ownership, although it has been on public display. And then on the right-hand side, the thorny question of single gold coin finds, because there are some people who are genuinely very interested in single gold coin finds, particularly of the Roman period. This is a 4th century coin which came out of the ground in um, South Gloucestershire, which obviously is not treasure because it's not uh, currently uh, described by the Treasure Act as a treasure item. But those single gold coin finds for that period are actually quite rare. Um, and so there's a rarity value. So there is a question about how do we designate what is treasure? And when that code of practice review comes around and we all get to be consulted, we need to think carefully about whether there should be a revision and what that revision would look like and how would we make measure uh, significance of these kinds of um, objects in order to be able to determine whether they were treasure or not. So what would be the description? Obviously, there are issues for, from museums' um, perspectives because not everybody benefits from a fines liaison officer being based in their museum. Uh, there's not every museum has got an archaeologist who knows what this kind of material is about. Things aren't always immediately obvious. So this is not a collection of toenail clippings, um, which is what they look like. Uh, in fact, there's a big hoard of nearly 500 of these. These are coin clippings. Um, they're coin clippings. They are objects they've, been, they've had... Uh, even if they were coins, they would be treasure because obviously it's more than 10. Um, but it, you've got to know what's treasure. And it's not always immediately obvious. And that 10% gold or silver is not always immediately obvious. So it looks like we've got a really good definition, but not every museum is equipped with somebody who will be able to determine that or has the process. Um, and so you need to find another source of information. And then there are museum issues in terms of capacity and finance. So. This is a very special find, which is called the Wollaston Hoard. It's a series of Bronze Age bangles, small bangles that are about this big, um, that were found nestled inside of each other in the Forest of Dean area. Um, the Forest of Dean, the Dean Heritage Centre, did not have the capacity to be able to acquire this item. Uh, fortunately, they are in the British Museum. They're really significant. They're completely unique in the archaeological record. Um, but the Forest of Dean area couldn't fundraise for it, didn't feel that they had the capacity to deal with it, um, and so they didn't express an interest. Um, so it didn't go into that museum. And that, what, that's what happens quite a lot with some museums. They haven't got the capacity to do this. It happens more often than not. And then how you express an interest. So this slide kind of came out of a conversation that I had with Stephanie one day when she was asking me about what happens at the Treasure Valuation Committee. And... Uh, it made me realise, actually, that when we see objects at Treasure Valuation Committee, we are sent a big, thick wadge of papers with all the photographs. And essentially, those museums that don't have access to the three-dimensional object have to express an interest based on an image. And it's only really... I mean, you're seeing a very good image just here. It shows up better on the screen. But when that's printed on paper, you don't get the detail, you don't get the weight of it, you can't turn it over. Um, and so is there a way that we can actually help museums that don't see the three-dimensional object decide, you know, in that decision-making process, uh, whether they want to express an interest. And then museums' yeah. issues engaging uh, with valuation. Um, so some people have, have said to me that they feel that they have an issue with, with engaging with the valuation process. And partly that's to do with ethics. And, you know, in the Museums <laughs> Association Code of Ethics, it says that curators should not do valuations for members of the public. But we are all, as curators, engaged in the process of needing to understand what these items might be worth, even for insurance, for loans. Um, and also, if you think about it, if you want to express an interest, you're going to have to find the, the reward money to pay for it. Very often that's public money. So you need to do a piece of work that involves understanding what that valuation is and where those sources are. And unfortunately, quite a lot of people don't do that because they are nervous of it. So we need to find a way of helping people to engage with this process because I know when I was doing some research before I went to, for the interview for Treasure Valuation that it's extremely rare that a museum will make a comment on the valuation process. You get lots of comments by finders but you don't get lots of comments by museums and there are things that you can talk about um, in your representations that aren't necessarily what it's worth or the monetary value that's been put, put on it. 
So just thought I'd say, look, we are all real people. This is a very nice picture that Ian took of us, and it's on the website, so don't look too hard. Um, but we are a variety of different people. Either I'm there to represent museums, but we've got people that represent um, the uh, valuation process, so people who work in the industry, uh, people who represent the metal detecting fraternity, and some experts in other areas. And obviously there's uh, Professor Lord Colin Renfrew in the centre who chairs it all. In terms of the workload that we have to do, there's been an exponential increase in the numbers of items of treasure that go, uh, that are actually identified as treasure. Over, I think it's about 1,200 last year, about a third or more of those will go through the process because the others are disclaimed. Um, we can have up to, I think last meeting was about 75 items on the agenda and they aren't single items, they can be groups of items or hoards. There's a huge amount of work that has to be done. And when you see these objects, sometimes you do sit there and wonder, what was the decision-making process on behalf of the museum in terms of expressing an interest? And how can we, as a subject specialist network, um, enable people to engage with that process in a more informed way? What do we need to do? So it started me off thinking about what is our strategic <coughs> approach to this? What can we do? And these were some of the suggestions that I came up for how SMA might be able to um, help people from the decision-making point, from writing the collecting policy, because that's where it should start, uh, as to whether a museum wants to acquire or disclaim, where to get the information from. So does it look like this? Are we going to produce best practice guidance related to that process from collecting po policy to acquisition? What is the development and provision of training or briefing sessions that we can do for other people? Because we're not the only ones that are disadvantaged sometimes in this process. The finders are too. So the material goes up to the British Museum. The finders also make representations. Uh, how do we enable them to understand um, the process and engage with it better? Um, what is the best practice guidance of how, when and if to respond to it? And is there a case for, for developing some kind of template that will prompt people, particularly those people who are not necessarily archaeologists who are based in museums, or finders? So that's my suggestion. I put at the bottom, what else? And at this point, this is where I expect you to come back and either ask some questions or express some of your frustrations, not too vehemently, um, and help us understand what we can do better. So is there anybody out there that would like to start us off?